It's good to be with brothers and sisters and where two or more are gathered in my name. He's here. He's here with us. And so let's bow for prayer. Lord, I just pray that your sweet, sweet spirit would just come upon us, Lord, and just fill us up, Lord. If you need to break us, break us, mold us, Lord, use us for your honor and glory. It's great to be in the house of the Lord. We ask your blessing upon this service, Lord, and speak to each and every one of our hearts. God, I can't change lives, but you can. By the power of your spirit, you change lives. And uh, so, Lord, just work on us today. Show us those things that you want us to grow in, Lord. May we be vessels that are willing to be used by you. We thank you and love you in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. If you'd like to stand, you can stand. If you want to sit, you can sit. Let's uh, worship the Lord together. share something <laughs> I think the Lord is putting on my heart so sorry to interrupt worship but um, well, as we were singing that I just felt like the Lord was looking down smiling and so you know I'm one I'm with those who think that they don't have a good voice and it, it doesn't matter because God gave us our voices and it doesn't matter what you sound like because it says make a joyful noise right 
And we're here to worship him, to thank him for everything he has done for us and through us and in us and our families and, and just protecting us and saving us through the blood of Jesus Christ. So I just am um, exhorting you to to cry out and worship and, and thank him and praise him. Forget everything. Let, let his spirit just wash the world away, just even if it's for 10 minutes of worship, if it's for an hour of service, if it's a day of the Sabbath. But let the spirit just refresh you and wash you and, and give it all to him. Just worship him. He knows your feelings. If you have to worship him in sadness, if you have to worship him in grief, if you have to worship him in anxiety, worship him because he's not judging us. He's looking at He is so happy that we're here to celebrate him. Amen. <laughs> How lovely is your dwelling place. My soul does long and even faints for you.
yesterday in Pine Valley Women's Retreat just for the day and so I'm trying to like I mean I didn't even ask for this but I really felt like the Lord was telling me with this song this isn't even for me it's for you guys for you guys online hi um you're gonna see a victory with your prodigals this year and they're gonna come back to the oh, 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 that's what I hear him telling me and I'm like I don't want to say it because it's you <laughs> so hold on to that promise Amen. Do everybody have some prodigals in their family? Anybody else have prodigals in their family? Amen. Can God bring them back? Amen. Praise God. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day. We just want to bless the service, Lord. We want to invite you to lead and guide it and direct Pastor Dave's words, Lord. Just Holy Spirit, touch each heart here and mind, Lord. To just reach in and have those unspoken prayers request 
requested to you, Lord, and answered this morning, Lord. We thank you for the church and the body ship and that your hand upon it and all of our ministries. In Jesus' name, and we all said, amen. amen. Quickly say hi to two or three people. Well, not that quick. You can be a little slow. Hi, people. Hi. Hi. What's next weekend? What's happening next weekend? Time change. Okay, Pastor Dave always never wants to. <laughs> so we spring forward, right? Spring forward. So what does that Does that mean we get an extra hour or we lose an hour? We lose an hour. Yeah, so we don't want anybody missing church. You get here at 11, it'll be over. Okay, so spring forward. Make sure you set your clocks back uh, for the night before. You know, I was reading where these two ladies were talking to each other, and the lady said, you know, I don't get these men who go to all these dating websites to meet women. That doesn't work. They should literally go to um, to the Hobby Lobby. Cause, because they said, you know, Hobby Lobby, the ratio of women to men is like 10 to 1. And the women are already there looking for things they don't need. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's pretty good. All right. Yeah. Hey, some of those ladies need us, you know. One I know, anyway. So uh, we, ha we have the calendar here and uh, just... Uh, you can always get those in the back, and we have a full week coming up and different studies throughout the week, the men's on Friday. And uh, so just mark your calendar and be sure to do it. We'll have our ushers come forward, give you a chance to uh, worship through your tithes and offerings. I was reading, you know, every once in a you see something funny in the Bible, you know, and I was reading um, in Kings about Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Remember the story? And the prophets of Baal, he said he challenged the prophets of Baal, and so he made a big... Uh, offering with lots of wood and he said you bring all the prophets of Baal and then you and don't light the don't light the fire you pray to your god Baal and let him light the fire and it, you know something like 150 or lots of these prophets of Baal were there and it says that they went on and on for half a day and and <laughs> Elijah says what is he is your god asleep do you need did you need to wake him up somehow maybe beat some pots and pans <laughs> And so they started yelling louder, and they slashed themselves with knives, and this went on. And then, but then Elijah says, okay, you guys are done. He said, now take water, buckets of water, and pour it all over the firewood and all over the altar. And he said, now do it again, and get more water, and just drench it and soak it. And then he prayed to God Almighty. What happened? Fire came down and consumed the whole thing and lapped up all the water and all the they put to death all the, the false prophets of Baal. So, but I just thought that was funny. I could just see him waiting and mocking and them carrying on. It says they start out dancing. and You could just see the show and then beating themselves and, and wearing themselves out. And then all I do is praise to the living God. We worship a living God, don't we? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. 
I think that song is so appropriate for today. He's going to put the words back up there. Look at him again in that last chorus. What is he doing today? He's a miracle worker. Find it back there. Miracle worker. Promise keeper. Light in the darkness. Isn't there a lot of darkness around today? My God, that is who you are. You know, and I want you to take out your sermon notes. Okay, everybody got sermon notes? Um, the kids can go to their classes. And so the junior high will be meeting outside downstairs today. And, uh, you know, you can see the top there, the title, Jesus Changes Lives Today. He is changing lives today. He's doing miracles. Everybody have a Bible? Here's a good question for you. If you had a week to live, what would you do? Next Sunday, you're going to die. You got one week. One week. What are you going to do with that one week? Tony, what are you going to do? Okay, be on your knees. Okay, yeah, that would be a good place to go. Linda, what would you do? Go get a massage. Go get a massage. What do you say, Linda? Okay. Yeah, definitely. That's it. We could be next week. Could be next Sunday. What are you going to do, you know? What are you going to do? Tom, what are you going to do? All good. Make sure everybody knows Jesus. Hey, Debbie, what are you going to do? Oh, <laughs> there you go. Yes. Steve, you got a job to do there. <laughs> One person said this, run up the credit card to the limit. Take a cruise. Visit family. Another person last night, I would make fu funeral arrangements so I wouldn't be a burden on my family. Another person said, I'll clean up the garage. <laughs> you know, so many different things. And in John chapter 12, which is the last chapter that we come to before the Jesus goes to the cross, 
One week from John chapter 12, Jesus is going to the cross. So if you look through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, there's 21 chapters in the book of John. Ten of them talk about the last week of Jesus' life. Ten of them. That's a lot, isn't it? Uh, Matthew has 28 chapters. Eight of them are devoted to the last week of Jesus' life. Mark, 16 chapters. Six are devoted to the last week. Luke, 24 chapters. Six are devoted to the last week. I think the last week of Jesus' life must have been important. And, uh, you know, headed into that, you know, we're coming up to Easter season, not too long down the road. And, you know, that's the best time to tell people about Jesus' death and resurrection and why he went to the cross to die for us. You know, um, there's a lot of different people who stole my Bible. I was having to do it all by memory. I know you. You need to pay the bills. <laughs> so... The last week of Jesus' life. There are so many people that react differently. People react, react differently to Jesus and what God's word says about him and why he came to this earth and why he died for us. Some people reject him. Some people mock. Some people are scoffers. Some people don't want to have anything to do with Jesus. They don't care what the proof is. You know, that he is the son of God, the miracles that he did. They challenge him. You know, they'll challenge you because you represent Jesus. And you are a miracle just by you being here today. You're a miracle. God's done something in your life. And, you know, God is doing things around the world today. And he is changing lives today. He is performing miracles today. And, and so... In the midst of all this stuff that's going on today, and which I'll talk about in a minute, Jesus is right there, and what the world, we sang this song, what the world meant for evil, God is using it in a mighty way. It's powerful how he's using it. And so, John chapter 11, let's start there. Go back to John chapter 11. Steve was just testing me to see if I could do it by memory. <laughs> John chapter 11, verse 45. Many, therefore, of the Jews who had come to see, uh, had come to Mary and beheld what he had done, what Jesus had done, what did they do? Believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done, Therefore, the chief priest and the Pharisees convened a council. Now, they have the Sanhedrin. There's 20, uh, 70 members of the Sanhedrin. They called the Sanhedrin together. There was chief priests. There was Pharisees. There were Sadducees. Uh, all gathered together. And look what they were questioning here. It says, what are you doing? Verse 47. For this man is performing many miracles, many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him. They didn't want all men to believe in him, did they? They were losing their power. They were losing their prestige. They were losing their authority over the people. Man, all men will believe in him. And then the Romans will come away and take both our place and our nation. But a certain one of them named Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year, said to him, you know nothing at all. Basically, he's calling them stupid. You're stupid. That one man should die. Oh, uh, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation should not perish. Now, this he did not say on his own initiative, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation one week away from when this was written and then it says in verse 52 and not for the nation only but that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad you know he died for the Gentiles as well for the as for the Jews and then it says 
Verse 53, from that day on, they planned together to worship Jesus. Any of your Bibles say that? From that day on, they planned to kill him. They got to get rid of Jesus. You know, they got to get the Terminator. You know, they wipe out Jesus. They got to get the assassins to wipe out Jesus. You know, there's assassins in our world today. There's assassins, 400 assassins that Putin sent to kill the president of Ukraine. And then there was assassins that one guy offered a million dollars to whoever will assassinate Putin, a Russian. You know, there's assassins taking place today. And so, hey, we got to send our guys and we're going to get rid of him because he is the resurrection and the life, and he proved it by raising Lazarus and others from the dead. So they said, not only do we need to get rid of Jesus, we need to get rid of the proof. We need to get rid of Lazarus as well. And that was their, that was their mindset. You know, Jesus said, I am the door. I am the vine. You know, I, I, I am the great I am. I am the living water. And it just goes on and on and on. Well, how do we know that's true? Look at the miracles. Look at the signs. And everybody knew about it. It wasn't done in secret. Everybody knew about it. You know, I mean, everybody, I don't know if too many people know exactly what's going on in our world today, what's going on in Ukraine. It's very sad what's happening there. A country is being wiped out. Innocent people are being killed, bombed, you know, um, it's a power grab. It's all about the money. It's all about the power. And they're, they're slowly working through so that they can send more troops. And then they want a water port so that they can send troops in that way and wipe them out. Now, God's using this for good in a lot of different ways, not the killing and everything else. But there is a lot of churches that are on fire for Jesus in the Ukraine. There's over 20 Calvary chapels, vibrant Calvary chapels right now today. And I was just at a meeting this last week. I can't tell you a whole lot, but they bought some vans. Uh, there's Calvary chapels in Poland. There's Calvary chapels in Hungary. And they're right at the border, and they're taking in first aid supplies and food and all kinds of stuff into the Ukraine right now today. There's a, the 10 passenger van, they load it up with food and supplies, take it into different cities where it gets taken out to the people, and then they fill up the van and they're taking people out to Poland and, and Hungary. I mean, and they're doing this all day long, this supply chain. Uh, you're part of that because we sent them, a, we know where the offerings are going when we send them there, because I know personally the guy that's heading up this whole thing, because remember I took a trip. This is the way God works everything out. I took a trip to Poland and Hungary a couple years ago, and these are the churches that are doing this, taking the food in. And they, they say the, the immigrants, the people that are coming out, they're setting up facilities all around their churches and in their churches for those people to come until they get situated. There's a massacre taking place. And uh, praise God that, you know, Christians are stepping up and doing what they can. They're, they're facing being killed, going back in. But they said, we can't, we got to go back in. We got to help these people out. And now there's even people that had left that want to go back and support their countrymen and their families that are still there. I don't know if you've seen any pictures. There's people in underground churches now that are praying and singing and worshiping and praising God. And they don't know what's going to go on. You know, is Putin and his power grab, is he just going to come in and just annihilate them? You know, just bomb them, just destroy their cities so that they don't have a country left? Well, back here, they, they, they were saying, hey, we want to get rid of Christians. We want to get rid of the, the Romans hated the Christians. Um, what did Caesar do? He set them up on telephone poles and lit them on fire going into Rome. 
He fed them to the lions in the Colosseum. In the first couple centuries, over six million Christians were martyred because they would not deny Jesus Christ as Lord. In a lot of ways, we have it soft today. We have running showers, hot water. We have food. We go to 7-Eleven. The uh, supermarkets all have food. You know, our gas prices are going up. Told you that was going to happen. Because we bring in every day 100, and I think it's 85 million gallons of, of gas, natural gas from Russia. And then some from, from Iran as well. And we have all the supplies, gas and, and uh, oil, right here in America if we open up our supplies. Well, we opened up our supplies from our National Reserve. Guess what that lasted? Three days. We all think, oh, it's, it's did a great good it, for three days. So, I mean, that, and all the countries in Europe are, are at, beckon, at Russia's beckoning call because they are getting gas and oil from Russia as well. See, it's all a political thing. It's all about power. And back here, it was all about the power. Sanhedrin had the power. You know, they could excommunicate. Drew, I'm going to excommunicate you. Because you're wearing black shoes. <laughs> they had the power to excommunicate people. And here's Jesus doing miracles that everybody would know about. But the world was drunk with, you know, the... The whole system that, you know, I'm, I'm going to get off of this in a minute, but the Chinese emperor and Putin had a meeting before the Olympics. You all know this? And the meeting was about the Chinese emperor said, hey, can you please wait to go into the Ukraine until after the Olympics? And so after the Olympics, I mean, we don't even hear about the Paralympics that are going on, but after the Olympics, a couple days, Putin went right into Ukraine, but he waited. And so who's in cahoots with each other? You know, they wanted the publicity. Did you hear anything about the human rights abuses that are taking place in China? People put into gulags, people that, I mean, you can't even get the Bible. You know, I mean, even Russia is kind of limiting what the, even their country knows about what's going on with the Internet and everything else. They, they have control over all that. It's a power grab. It's a money grab. And, uh, you know, so we need to be aware of that. Don't get drunk with Chinese money and goods. Um, Taiwan will probably be next and Hong Kong. And, uh, you know, the slave camps are going to continue. I mean, there are people are being fired because they're Christians in different places in the United States. I mean, they're shutting it, it down. And, uh, you know, we need to stand up for what we believe. In John chapter 12, verse 12, on the next day, I could say a lot more, but I'm not going to. On the next day, the great multitude had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming. I mean, multitudes were flocking, you know, to the public ministry of Jesus, to his healing and, and hearing his sermons. And in chapter 13, now he's going to start the private ministry with the disciples. But it says they took branches of the palm trees and they went out to meet him and they began to cry out, Hosanna! I mean, that's what we should be crying out today. What does Hosanna mean? Save us now. Man, Jesus, save us now. And blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Can Jesus do miracles today? Teresa was praying about the prodigal sons, the prodigal daughter. So many of you raised your hands. You know, Jesus can heal people from addictions. He can set people free. 
He can change their lives. He can, change, he can cleanse people's minds and their hearts. Have you ever been around somebody that's on meth? Meth epidemic is sky high today. You know, I, two people last week that are, were high on meth, they're, they're hallucinating, they're imagining things, schizophrenic, you know, all these fears that are taking place. It's horrible what meth will do to somebody. Jesus can change somebody's life. Ask the person next to you, has Jesus changed your life? I hope so. <laughs> it says he, want to take, he wants to take you out of darkness into the light. He wants to give you more faith, more love, more hope. And that's what the world needs today. We need faith, hope, and love. He wants to give you more joy in your life. You know, do you have the joy of the Lord in your life today turn to john chapter 9 here's one of the healings that jesus did john chapter 9 verse 20 well a miracle had taken place this guy was received his sight in verse 18 and they questioned them saying is this your son talking to the parents who you say was born blind you notice the what do you call it? Uh, sarcasm. Who you say was born blind. Oh, sure. And then it says, then how does he now see? And, uh, you know, what's going to be your answer, parents? The parents answered in verse 20 and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. It's like, are you guys idiots? We know he was born blind. We know he's our son. But now he sees, we don't know how, who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He's of age. You know, he's 18. He's of age. He shall speak for himself. And the parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. He would be excommunicated. For this reason, the parents said, he is of age, ask him. So the second time they called the man who had been born blind, and they said, give glory to God. Again, sarcastic. It's like, think twice about how you're going to answer this. Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He therefore answered, whether he's a sinner or not, I do not know. But one thing that I know, that where is I was blind, now what? I, what a great answer. Where he was blind, now he sees. He's been set free from that illness or whatever it is that caused it. And uh, the wonder-working power of Jesus. I mean, he can set the blind man f uh, free. Another miracle that Jesus did. Go to Mark chapter 1. There's so many of them. I just picked a few of them just so you get the point. Mark chapter 1, verse 23. Or uh, let's start verse 40. Chapter 1, verse 40. There is a leper that came to him, beseeching him, <clears throat> and falling on his knees. We saw this a couple weeks ago. And he said to him, If you are willing, make me clean. And moved with compassion, he stretched out his hand, and what did he do? Touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus had authority to do that. And uh, not only that, but he also was able to heal people that had demons. Mark chapter 1, verse 23. And just there was a synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, demons, and he cried out and he said, Hey, what do we have to do with you, Jesus? Jesus of Nazareth, have you come to destroy us? For I know who you are. The demon even know who Jesus is. I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God 
And Jesus rebuked him and said, Be quiet and come out of him. And throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. And they were all amazed, and they debated among themselves, What is this? A new teaching, not like our teachings, a new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and what do they do? They obey. Another great healing of Jesus, proving that he is God. Here's another one. Turn to um, Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, verse 37. And behold, there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. Now that's us. We're all sinners saved by grace, aren't we? You know, someone asked me the other day, well, what does it mean when we sin? And I, I see this little diagram here? It means to miss the mark. If I were to take a bow and arrow and try to shoot at it at a target, guess what I would do? Miss the mark. You don't want to be standing anywhere around. I'd miss the mark. Well, God says we have all missed the mark. See all those arrows? When we've missed the mark and fallen short of the glory of God. The target represents God, and the arrows represent us our sins, and there's many that are there. But thank God he loved us so much that he died for us on the cross to redeem us and set us free. This woman was very immoral. She's missed the mark. And then it goes on, and what does it say? <clears throat> Verse uh, 37. And when she learned that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with their tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with perfume. You know that? I mean, she, her life had changed so much. She had just fallen in love with Jesus. And here's the verse 39. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet... He would know who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him. You know, it's like in the congregation today, the person sitting in front of you, behind you, next to you, if you would know what type of person that is or was, you would move to the other side of the room. But now that person's life has changed. And now that person, you know, has been redeemed by the blood of Jesus and has been set free from the slavery of Satan and sin. And that woman had been set free from the slavery of sin and her immoral lifestyle. A lot of people still love their sins. They love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. And they still reject Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You know what's neat? To see a, a dad or a mom that really loves on their kids. You know, I, I'm seeing that again in so many people here in this room, but also in my daughter and, and my son-in-law, who are just loving on my grandson, David, 13 months old. And it's just wonderful to see and, and just see David just light up when he sees mom and dad loving on him and playing with him and having a good time. It's wonderful. You know, they showed me pictures. They took him to his first swimming lessons at the Croc Center, 13 months old. And there was like eight babies in the pool. And the video shows all the different babies, and they're crying and they're whining and they're, yeah! And there's David in mom's arms, and he's so happy. This is so much fun. <laughs> he's having a great time. You know, and Jesus wants to love on all of us. He 
wants to love on us, just like a mom's love or a dad's love for their kids or grandkids. Extravagant love. My mom, she's a cookie. <laughs> we lived up in Daly City area for five years, and it was during my high school years. And uh, during that time, I was doing my thing. And uh, after a game or something, you know, people would invite you out. And I, I wouldn't drink, but I'd go to different parties and different things that were going on. And uh, no matter what time I came home, <laughs> my mom was awake, waiting for me. She'd be in her room with Dad, but I tried so stealthy <laughs> to be very quiet coming in, not making any noise, you know. And all of a sudden, from her room, I'd say, I'd hear these words, Hi, Dave! <laughs> I could not get in without her awake. She was awake. She would not go to sleep until I went to bed. You know, and then she would say as I'm going downstairs to where my room was, I love you. Good night. I knew it was going to happen every time I came home. I knew it. And uh, Jesus is constantly loving on people and healing people and setting them free. Turn to Luke chapter 13. I told the group last night, I, I'm probably going to divide this into two sections. Luke chapter 13, verse 11. There was a woman who for 18 years, can you imagine 18 years, who had a sickness caused by a demon, caused by a spirit. And she was bent over double and could not straighten up at all. And when Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, woman, you are freed from your sickness. Do you know any other person that's ever lived that could do this? No. Only Jesus, God in human flesh. You are freed from your sickness. And he laid his hands upon her, and immediately she was made a wreck again. And she began glorifying God. She began praising God. Go to John chapter 11. All these verses are there. You can look them up on your own. You don't have to believe what I say. Believe what the scriptures say. June chap uh, John chapter 11, verse 40, it says, Jesus said to her, I did not say to you if you believe, or did I not say to you if you believe, you will see the glory of God. If you believe, you'll see the glory of God. And then in verse 53, we have the story about Lazarus, and Jesus said in verse 43, when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! And he who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around him with a cloth, and, and he said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many, verse 45, therefore of the Jews, who had come to Mary, and behold what he had done, believed in him. There's only one person that had that type of power that came down to this earth at Christmas to pay a ransom for our sins on the cross to set us free. This great miracle of Lazarus being raised from the dead, look at the reaction here of the Pharisees. It says in verse 53, the Sanhedrin, from that day on, they planned together to what? Kill him. From that day on, they wanted to kill Jesus. And, uh, you know, the world doesn't like Christians. There's so many Christians have been martyred from the first century until today. And even today, they're being martyred to different places around the world. And they're trying to enslave Christians. You know, there's a, a court case going on right now, one in Canada, one in Australia, about some pastors that are going to be thrown into jail because they preach the Bible. I mean, it's taking place. And, uh, you know, we, 
they're ready. They they know, you know, that the world is stacked against them. You know, the, the power of the principalities and forces of this world. But they're willing to take a stand for Jesus. All they have to do is don't preach the Bible. You know, in China, many pastors thrown into jails. You know, in Russia and all these other places. And... Uh, but they're willing to take a stand for Jesus. Why? Because Jesus bought them, redeemed them, changed their lives. You know, how can we not declare? How can we not confess with our mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord? And uh, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the chief priests, again, thought if we just get rid of Jesus and Lazarus, then our problems will be solved. They nailed him to a cross. He died, was buried. What happened three days later? Rose from the grave. And guess what? Their problems multiplied. They even put a guard around the tomb. That didn't help. And they put the Roman seal on the tomb. That didn't help. You know, it it wasn't so that Jesus could escape. It was so that people could see that the grave was empty. And he's still doing miracles today. He's still healing people today. You're a living example. You're a testimony. You're a testimony to the power of God. I'm just going to close, just give you a few verses. Matthew 5, turn to Matthew 5, verse 16. Let your light shine. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works, how God's changed your life, and glorify your Father who is in heaven. What does that say? Let your light shine. You know, we have those little flashlights that, you know, we've been giving out. And, uh, you know, let your light shine in a dark world. Let your light shine at work. Let your light shine in your community. Let your light shine at your local 7-Eleven. Let your light shine everywhere you go. You never know the impact that you'll have on other people. A lot of you have grandkids. Man, let your light shine with them. Let them see your love, your joy, your peace, your patience, your goodness, your kindness, your self-control. Let your light shine. You know, um, last Sunday, there was a lady that was here. Um, her doctor is a Christian doctor who I go to. And so every time I go there, I just say hello to her. How are how you doing? How's everything going on? You know, you're, you're welcome to come and join us anytime. She lives right back here in these apartments. And uh, so she always says hello to me. That light's going to keep blinking until Satan is just rebuked. Um, so she lives right back here and I asked her, I said, well, how is it back there? And she said, well, in the front part where I live right behind the fence, it's great. But you go down to the other side. She said, there's all kinds of wickedness and corruption and lying and stealing and all kinds of stuff going on. And, uh, she said, "I, I knew I needed to get back to church. And so she showed up, just out of the blue. Uh, You can pray for her. Her name is Kathleen. And, uh, you know, just from the testimony of just being nice to her and kind to her and loving on her, you know, we said, hey, we got plenty of food. Take some food. She took a big bag of food with her. Let your light shine. Turn to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Verse 12, again, Jesus said to them, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. No longer walking in darkness, but have the light of life. 
Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. Ephesians 5, 8. I love this. Therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are what? Lights in the Lord. You were formerly darkness, now you're lights in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Walk as children of the light. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Peter 2, 9 says, You are a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of the darkness into what? Marvelous light. You know, I, I can't go everywhere. I can't be everywhere. But you can. You are a bridge builder. Never forget this. You're a bridge builder leading people to Jesus. You were formerly in darkness. Now you're in the light. You are proclaimers of this. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. Just a couple more verses. Everybody still with me? 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said light shall shine out of the darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And then again, in, back in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. And uh, it's a great verse. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. And we have the prophetic word made more sure. We have the scriptures. To which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. God's word is a lamp shining in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. God's word, a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. That's why we need God's word. You know that people in different countries of the, way, of the world pay months and months of salaries just to have a Bible. And yet we give them away all the time. You know, if you don't own one, take one from the back. I mean, we, we probably have two or three Bibles at home, right? Somewhere. God's word, his sure word is so important. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not miss the mark, that I may not walk in darkness. So, you know, God is doing a work today. I, I know he is, and I know he loves each and every one of us, and some of us have some rough edges, and God is sandpapering them off. He's changing us. He's renewing us. You know, um, Many places in the world, hell's power. Satan thinks he's got it. He's temporarily the God of this world, but he eventually is going to be cast into hell forever. You know, the gates of hell shall not prevail against God's church. And even though they tried to stamp it out, man, it, it comes back stronger. When we're persecuted, you have to have strong faith. And you have to rely on the Lord, not the government, not your bank account. We need to rely on the Lord. You know, a sad statistic that I read last week was people in church spend more on dog food than they do in their tithing. That's a pretty sad statistic, isn't it? And, uh, you know, praise God that we have so many faithful people here and that we can s send money to missionaries or we can send money to help people out that are going on in the Ukraine and you have stars in heaven you know the food bank ministry people coming in all the time and us taking food out to different places I can't even imagine 5,000 pounds of food last week we gave out that's amazing you know God is using it as a testimony as a witness 
to Jesus Christ and the power of the resurrection. We're going to stop there. I want you to close your Bibles. Remember next week, I hate time change. Next week, you got to move your clocks ahead. How long? One hour. You lose an hour of sleep. Go to bed earlier on Saturday night, right? Also going on next week, men's Bible study on Thursday night here at the church. Come and join us. We're going through 1 Peter. And that starts at 6.30. Our Wednesday night study with Pastor Dan, 6.30. Our Bible study on Tuesday night. On Friday night, some people say, hey, can we just come and worship the Lord and praise him? Well, Friday night at 6.30, our worship and prayer night. And then um, we're going to have a couple's luncheon on the 20th of this month. Put that on your calendar now. Uh, we're going to have a, a community outreach on the 25th and the 26th. Um, we, we made up some of these uh, door hanger things to take around some of these new places that we have around here. You know, God says the, the fields are white for harvest, but the laborers are what? Few. You know, so come out. We, we got plenty of door hangers, and we're also going to be taking food out if you want to join us with that. Do a neighborhood outreach on the 26th. And, um, you know, so keep these things in prayer. Keep them in prayer. And I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up here and the ushers to come forward. Uh, we're going to close this service by taking communion together, worshiping Jesus. And um, we do this in remembrance of him, the scriptures say. And I, I challenge you. If there's anything in your life where you're missing the mark, where you're falling short of the glory of God, where you're walking in darkness and not in the light, today, before we take communion, is a good time to get it taken care of. The scriptures say in the Corinthian church was a very carnal church. It said some of you are sick and some of you have died because you've taken communion, communion unworthily you're like you're throwing it in God's face and you're saying hey I don't care what the scriptures say I'm going to do my own thing and so God says every time before we do this to check your heart make sure you're right with Jesus just close your eyes for a second let the spirit of the living God just speak to your lives your heart your mind your soul Is there anything in your life that you would be ashamed if Jesus were to come back today? That you would be ashamed. You're, you're mocking him. You're throwing it right back in his face. Your life really isn't a living testimony. You're walking in sin. You're walking in darkness. Right now, this morning, be cleansed. Be set free from the slave of slavery of sin and Satan. Have the prison doors opened right now today. Walk out. Ask forgiveness. Jesus says he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins as we confess them to him. And so right now in the quiet seat that you're in, if something's missing in your life, your relationship with Jesus is not what it should be. Come to him right now. His arms are open wide. He wants to love on you. He wants to hug you and say, you're my daughter. You're my son. I bought you. I love you. So as our heads are bowed and there's sin or sins in your life that you need to ask God's forgiveness, just raise your hand right now and say, yeah, that's me. God bless you. 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 Anybody else before we take communion together? God bless you.
Thank you, Jesus. We see the power of God working right now in this church. Changing people's lives. Bringing them back into fellowship with you. That's the most important thing. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And then all these other things will be added unto you. So right now we invite you to come as we sing. Take a stand for Jesus. Be a witness. Be a testimony for him. In the name of Jesus, come. There's a place mercy reigns and never dies. There's a cross for our sins setting us free now you tell us be a testimony walk with me confess with your mouth Jesus Christ is Lord don't be ashamed of me don't be a mocker don't be a scoffer we live for you Lord you give us another week on this earth that we would glorify your name that we'd worship you While they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it and he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Remember me. Don't forget me. Don't forget what I did for you. He went to the cross. He could have called down legions of angels to give his life as a ransom for my sins, for your sins. Take and eat.
last month there was over a thousand people that watched the uh, services online at some time during the week you never know you never know what type of impact our lives will have upon other people they're watching you they're observing you they're seeing if Jesus has really changed your life and uh, if you're watching today or during the week just take some water out of your refrigerator or your orange juice or grape juice or whatever it's whatever you have it represents the blood of Christ and Jesus it says took a cup and he gave thanks and gave it to him and he said drink from this all of you for this is my blood of the new covenant which is to be shed on behalf of many for the forgiveness of sins thank you Jesus for forgiving our sins we do this in remembrance of you take and drink just pass your cups to the center if you would God bless you all Jim will have some extra coffee for you next Sunday. <laughs> and uh, take some food with you and share it with others. And praise God that we are still able to be together. And you don't have to wear a mask anymore. Only if you're a student in high school or elementary school. Don't ask me how crazy that is. That is so crazy. You know, um, it kind of was so weird to me that before the, uh, what's the speech Biden gave? Save the Union. Before the, the day before the State of the Union address, he's walking on the lawn of the White House. Nobody around him, nobody anywhere, and he's wearing a mask. I'm going, you're not going to get COVID if you're walking alone <laughs> on the lawn and then the next day Pelosi's by some whatever says okay you, no one has to wear a mask during the political game of the speech you don't have to wear a mask anymore so everybody's hugging and kissing each other <laughs> and nobody's wearing a mask anymore I'm going what changed in one day right? you know was it so that everybody on TV could see their faces because elections are coming up and, you know, see them get shaking the president's hand and all so happy and, you know, what changed? And uh, I just hope the change will be in our hearts that we'll keep falling in love with Jesus more and more putting him number one in our lives. Um, if you want to send a donation to Ukraine and what's going on there, there's envelopes over here and over here. You can just put a check or money in the envelopes and on the outside say Ukraine. And 100% uh, of it will go to Ukraine, to the Calvary pastor that's right on the front line. And he will get it out to the people in Ukraine. That's the way you can do it. Somebody asked me last night, so I just, you can do it that way or you can do, you know, PayPal or Tithely or whatever and just say on there that you wanted to go to Ukraine and uh, you'll be participants in helping out those people. I can't even imagine your city being, La Mesa being bombed and destroyed. Innocent people being killed that's going to happen in a lot of other places very soon. Jesus, Hosanna, save us now. Amen. Tell the person next to you, I'm glad you were here today. God bless you. Take some food. Take some donuts. Have a great day.